I am thrilled to be showing you uh, a little bit of the work that we're doing in the social neuroscience and psychotherapy lab, which is based primarily at the Portland VA and at uh, Oregon Health and Science University. Oh. Um, so our mission is to maximize the benefits of psychotherapy and therapeutic alliance for, for PTSD and addiction through the adjunct use of social psychopharmacology, such as oxytocin, MDMA, and psilocybin. So we're really centering the relational component of the intervention rather than the drug. Uh, some of the vision and, and values of the lab, uh, we really want our research to inform the feasibility of safely implementing psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy in real-world clinical settings uh, to those most in need. And my lab has existed in uh, traditional Western medical uh, structures. So we're at the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, in academic medicine. And typically, these systems function, function as linear hierarchical structures, like a tall tree. Uh, but I'm inspired by collaboration and community. And in my lab, we're always striving to achieve a more rhizomatic organizational structure, which uh, is made up of an evolving network of communicating nodes with no clear beginning and end, and it spreads vertically rather than hierarchically. And interestingly, rhizomatic research systems have been taking form within the federal uh, organizations that fund research in order to facilitate multi-site collaborative research. And Portland's a node within both the VA Cooperative Studies Program with a, a network of dedicated enrollment sites or nodes and the National Institute on Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network. And so we kind of envision ourselves moving into this space. Uh, and finally, we all know from biology that a healthy ecosystem is a diverse ecosystem. And so we put a lot of effort into represent representation at all levels of our work, from our community partners to our lab staff and therapists uh, and to our uh, clinical trial participants. So now I'm going to highlight two clinical trials that we've been working on. The first is a proof-of-concept open-label clinical trial of MDMA-assisted group therapy for veterans with PTSD. Uh, I had the, the timeline, the study timeline up, but it looked like the New York subway system. So uh, now I just have a picture of people in, with group therapy. But I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. So we have preparation and integration, most of it together as a group. Each veteran gets two MDMA sessions. The first will be individual, uh, and then it'll, there will be an individual prep and integration before and after. And the second MDMA session will be conducted together as a group cohort. Um, and we're working together with cohorts of up to six veterans at a time. Uh, and most of the sessions, group and individual sessions, will be f facilitated by therapy uh, dyads but we will be working in uh, facilitator teams of four. And for the group MDMA session and the integration session the day after, all four facilitators will be present. Uh, and we've done a lot of work to build cohesion among our team, and we've just kind of organically found that the uh, strongest team tends to consist of a medical provider, a psychologist, a spiritual care provider, and a peer support specialist. Um, one of my collaborators over the last couple of years has been Chaplain Rebecca Morris, who has pioneered specific to the Portland VA a program for veterans who have gone through the traditional VA PTSD treatment and still have moderate to severe PTSD. They now have this uh, program that Rebecca started um, called Compassionate Warrior Training for Reintegration. And it's a, it's a six-month program. Over the course of the six months, uh, she folds in family members and significant others, and then eventually civilian community members in order to witness the healing process of these veterans, uh, which is really, really powerful. And prior to the pandemic, there were three sweat lodge ceremonies uh, over the course of the six months, so already working with non-ordinary states of consciousness as part of the communal and relational program. Uh, this program also relies heavily on veteran peer support from veterans who have success successfully gone through the program and are now certified uh, by National Alliance on Mental Illness uh, to be peer support specialists. And they have hundreds of hours under their belts co-facilitating PTSD groups 
And these are three veteran peer support specialists who are working in our lab and who have been MAPS trained uh, to work with uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, this is a, a visual tool used to rate how pragmatic a specific research study is. Uh, so traditional laboratory-based research studies under ideal con conditions are lower numbers closer to the center of the circle, and then around the perimeter uh, are more pragmatic real-world studies. So you can see that we're moving toward more pragmatic research with this trial design uh, by partnering with existing clinic structures within the VA. And then I just wanted to add, uh, so transgender veterans have three times the rate of PTSD as non-transgender veterans. Uh, however, according to the PTSD repository that's hosted by the National Center for PTSD, there has not been a single transgender person explicitly represented in any PTSD intervention trial. Uh, and so we're seeking approval for additional cohorts for our MDMA group study f of, of transgender, gender diverse participants. Uh, and the images here are gender diverse therapists, who uh, many of whom received health equity scholarships for the MAPS MDMA therapy training program last year in preparation to work on this trial. Uh, it'll be a multi-site partnership between our lab and a uh, lab in Salt Lake City. Uh, and then collaborators and I are also about to publish the results of a series of focus groups that we uh, did engaging gender diverse people in the design of the clinical trial. Uh, and now changing gears to set up our second clinical trial. Uh, according to the most recent national survey on drug use and health, Oregon is now the highest uh, as far as the prevalence of meth use of any state. And veteran overdose deaths related to methamphetamine increased 669% between 2010 and 2019. Uh, and the only drug with a higher increase during that period was uh, fentanyl. So this is the Portland VA Recovery House. It's a 35-bed residential treatment facility. They enroll about 40 veterans with methamphetamine use disorder per year. Uh, and typical treatment at this residential setting involves a minimum 45-day stay and then a range of, of medical, mental health, and social work services. Uh, for the most part, if a veteran comes in without housing, they leave with housing. Um, and this is also the setting of our trial of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for methamphetamine use disorder. And so you can see that uh, this because of the residential setting, this study is even more pragmatic than the MDMA group study for PTSD. Uh, veterans enrolled in this trial will be randomized to two conditions, or are randomized to two conditions, uh, residential treatment as usual, or residential treatment uh, plus a course of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. And so those randomized to the psilocybin arm will receive several prep and integration therapy sessions in addition to two psilocybin sessions, 25 and 30 milligrams, about two weeks apart. And we're looking at acceptability, safety, uh, feasibility measures, as well as methamphetamine use uh, at baseline, and then two and six months after discharge from the residential unit. Uh, and now I'm incredibly pleased to hand it over to uh, Jenna, who is a PhD student working in my lab, who moved across the country last year to uh, do the work that she's about to tell you uh, about. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna, and I'm here today because I have a question. Thinking about the psychological changes conferred by psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, I'm wondering what changes might we see in the body? Whoops. Apparently, I don't know how to use this thing. Hold on. There we go. All right. All right. So. First, I'm curious how psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy might impact chronic inflammation, or inflammation. When inflammation becomes chronic, it can damage the body and contribute to disease. And it's associated with mental health ailments such as PTSD and substance use disorders. You could think about chronic inflammation and these ailments as being protective mechanisms gone awry. They were once protective, but at some point, they spiraled into causing harm. 
Now, many of us know that psychedelics act on serotonin receptors in the brain, but serotonin receptors aren't only in the brain. They exist throughout the body, including on immune cells. Some research has shown that psychedelics can reduce inflammation and that psychotherapy can reduce inflammation. But we don't know yet much about these things together. I'm also interested in heart rate variability, which describes the interval of time between consecutive heartbeats and tells us about autonomic nervous system function. And finally, I'm interested in cortisol, a hormone that helps maintain homeostasis and is involved in the stress response. Cortisol levels naturally change throughout the day, and examining these changes can tell us about someone's overall health. Oh. Okay. Um, so you just heard about our psilocybin study. Well, methamphetamine use is associated with greater inflammation, more autonomic nervous system dysregulation, and poor overall health. So I'm measuring inflammation, heart rate variability, and cortisol in veterans before and after they receive psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. For those not receiving the psychotherapy, I'm measuring these variables over an equivalent time span. And then later, I'll see if any changes occur and if there are differences in any changes that do occur. And I'm so very excited to be looking at these outcomes as they relate to the full synergy of psilocybin and psychotherapy. I'm also so grateful for my mentors, Dr. Stoffer and Dr. Loftus, and for the many amazing people in our research lab. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> Go sit down. Our next panelist is Dr. Pamela Crisco. Dr. Crisco is a physician, researcher, instructor, kayaker, and permaculture gardener. She is the medical lead on the innovative Roots to Thrive Psychedelic Assisted Therapy nonprofit, a founding board member of the Psychedelic Association of Canada, the medical lead of the Postgraduate Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy at Vancouver Island University. Her research interests include microdosing, psilocybin, ketamine-assisted therapy, MDMA therapy, chronic pain, and mental health. She's an adjunct professor at VIU and a clinical instructor at UBC, University of British Columbia. She's the co-founder of Myco Medica Life Science Public Benefit Corporation. Prior to studying medicine, she was a city of, cannot say that, Coquitlam? <laughs> Uh, firefighter for eight years and provincial forestry firefighter for four seasons. She currently resides in the traditional territory of the Clahus First Nations. Dr. Pamela Crisco. Okay, advance. There we go, uh, that's already been said. Um, here are some of my disclosures. I have no uh, uh, commercial disclosures related to um, psychedelic assisted therapy. I am the medical lead at uh, Roots to Thrive. I am a volunteer advisor for Nectera, clinical advisor for Numinous Wellness, and a science advisor and co-founder of Micromedica Life Sciences. Uh, in BC, we like to give a land acknowledgement, and where I get 
the privilege of uh, working and playing is on the Clahoose First Nations land and the Stunamis First Nations land in British Columbia. Our program, Roots to Thrive, published last year, um, or this year, sorry, um, on our program. And we're a community-based program that offers psychedelic-assisted therapy. And I want to start this because the results make me happy as a physician. Of the people that came into our 12-week resiliency program, with three embedded ketamine-assisted ketamine psychedelic-assisted therapy sessions within that 12-week uh, program, 91% had clinically significant reductions in anxiety, 79% clinically significant reductions in depression. 86 of those frontline healthcare uh, workers, first responders that came into the program with PTSD no longer qualified for that diagnosis when they left the program. And 92% said they had a significant life balance. So, the reason I'm up here talking about this nonprofit, Roots to Thrive, is because I think it, it really shows how we can do a lot of positive work in the community. A lot of our team members are academics as well, but community-based research is incredibly important to this field. So our program has three tenets, service, research, and education. We put service at the beginning because that's the most important. We're in a healthcare crisis, we're in an opioid use crisis, a substance use crisis. People need treatment now. And so what we're doing is offering the service and then doing the research and, and adding in the education. So the service component, like I said, is um, there's two programs. There's a 12-week ketamine-assisted therapy program that is group. Everything we do is group therapy, working together in small groups of eight people with two facilitators, but a very large team wrapping around that container. We focus on healthcare, first-line healthcare responders, our first-line healthcare providers, first responders, veterans. The majority of people come into the program with PTSD. They also have concurrent diagnoses of depression, anxiety, OCD, addictions, and eating disorders. The other part of our program is the psilocybin-assisted therapy, which is an eight-week program, which is a program that we put together very quickly because it was necessary. People with end of life. Um, we're getting, starting to get their Section 56 exemptions and SAP exemptions in Canada. And we knew that they could heal better together in community. This was a feedback that came out of many participants in the dyad and one-on-one -on -one therapies, and we knew that if we brought them together in a community of healing, that they would do better. And so that program is um, of interest um, because at the, the very first group that went through that actually got psilocybin mushrooms. And so we got to see um, 10 people go through on psilocybin mushrooms. The second group went through with synthetic, which we got access to from Health Canada through special access program. And in the second cohort that went through the program, we actually had people in the same group therapy, some on psilocybin mushrooms because that was their exemption, and some on synthetic psilocybin because that was our exemption. And so for the first time ever, we had a group therapy where people were having a psychedelic therapeutic journey on both, and we got to compare them. We've just found out yesterday that Health Canada has given us 14 more exemptions, and so we have two more cohorts that have just started, and they'll be getting their end-of-life um, therapeutic group therapy. And Health Canada has indicated that uh, our group is in the pipeline for hundreds more because of the quality of the work that we are doing and the service we are providing. So what's really important about this is that we're an interdisciplinary team based in the community. And the reason that I'm bringing, putting this slide up right now is because this is the team that influences our research. We have indigenous knowledge keepers, indigenous elders, we have medical doctors, we have nurses, therapists, energy workers, somatic body workers, spiritual care clergy members, and we feel that the more people that are at the table, the more people that are in that, that ideating idea of what the research needs to be, the better we're going to do and the better we're going to show up in service to the communities that we serve. So these interdisciplinary teams, they're, not only are they, um, they're, we're better together as a collaborative, we're better together as a healing community, we're better together as a non-hierarchical uh, research team, and then we just have a lot more fun. The research team is, is um, 
one of the best. Like, if, if you work in a lab and you're not having fun, find another lab. Our lab is fun, it's collaborative. This is what you want, this is your life. You have, you, the research comes out so much better when you're inspired and you show up and you want to be there with those people. And so we have a lot of projects going on. We're like this little team that can. So we're researching all sorts of things related under the uh, Roots to Thrive nonprofit. So we've got our ketamine therapy is being um, studied at multiple levels, quantitative and qualitatively. The psilocybin therapy is being researched on, on quantitatively and qualitatively. We're studying how therapist training is. Remember, what we're, how we're training therapists and how we're doing therapy is just what we know now. We're not done. We're still iterating. There are always better ways of doing it, and that's what we want to find out, is what is the best way to train therapists and what are the best way to have really skilled therapists out there in the world. We're playing around with some medical devices or some wonder medical devices that help drop our patients with high anxiety down into their parasympathetic systems and so that the therapy is maybe even more effective for them. We're playing around with some virtual reality. We'll see how that turns out. We've got a firefighter group that's going through with firefighters that have gone through our program. Their PTSD is gone. They have now come back, trained on the program, and they are now the facilitators for the next group of firefighters that will be going through. And, and safety data, because we're doing a few things that nobody else is doing, and so we want to publish and show that not only is what, not only is what we are doing in the community feasible, but it's safe and it's effective. So we're trying to fill in the gaps. Where are the gaps in the research? I think that's where we always want to be going. The third pillar is education. So research has to inform how education will go, but education has to come back and and fill that circle of how research should go. So the first class just started two weeks ago on Vancouver Island in the first ever academic program in Canada, postgraduate certificate in uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, and they're doing great. And again, it's a non-hierarchical. We have MDs in there with nurses, with therapists, with indigenous knowledge keepers, somatic body workers, clergy. It is the, it, it is the place where they're invited to come in, heart opened, take off their hat, and lean in and learn together. And I'd like to say, like, right now, it's pretty exciting to already see the synergisms coming in a program. So community-based research, this is really why I'm up here about Roots to Thrive, is that I'm an academic, I work in an academic center, but community-based research is so important. The community needs to tell us what they need to be studied. And, and so that's one of the things, that's one of the, the goalposts for Roots to Thrive is to always be listening to what the community needs and what they want us to research. We come from a very colonized education system. So Vancouver Island University and the Roots to Thrive nonprofit, we embody this, th this um, way of knowing that we call two the two-eyed seeing approach where we get to weave in, in indigenous ways of knowing with the indigenous knowledge keepers of the territory on whose land we have the privilege of living and working. And we get to weave in the Western ways that we know and take the best of both worlds, create a container that's even better, and continue to iterate it to the next level. So we're never done. We're never just going to rest on our laurels. We're always going to say, how can we make this an even better research project or an even more informed research project? It's patient-oriented research. All through every part of the program, there is 100% available uh, anonymous feedback, and I highly recommend that you need to have that feedback to keep the research loop going so that you know where you're getting it right, you know where you're getting it wrong, and this is some of the best information we get, some of the best ideas we get is from the anonymous feedback. Continual quality improvement. And mental health, the majority of mental health care is done in our communities. So the academic research is great. The double-blind placebo trials are great. The mechanism, mechanisms of action trials are great. We need them all. But we need community-based research. We need to know how these interventions help in the community and how we can do it better because that's where most of us are working. That is where most of us are in service to our patients and our clients. 
And the other part is when we meet with insurers that want to send people through our program, they're blown away that we have near 90% completion rates. That blows away most of the completion rates of other projects. And that's because we listen to the patients and what they need. So we're in a mental health crisis right now. So that's why we're doing the therapy and then studying it. We can't wait. People are dying. We had 200 people die in BC last year of overdoses. We can't live with that as clinicians. And so what we're doing, we find we're working in this model that is providing the therapy, quality improving it, and then researching it and publishing on it to see how we can do it better. We're in a substance use crisis now. And this type of research is substantially less expensive. The clinical trials, they're great. Uh, the double-blind placebo is, is very expensive, and they give great data. But our research is cheap. As a nonprofit, we can run through these, these small little trials for under $10,000. So, and then we can publish on that, and we can iterate on, it, on that, and we can collaborate and share that with others. And we're narrowing the health implementation gap. It takes 17 years on average to move research into practice. We don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of time. I want to get stuff done now. And increasing access. We're all talking about access. This is how people get access. Most people can't get access to clinical trials. In these sort of things, we don't have huge lists of exclusions, so the patients can get into the therapy and still participate in the clinical research. And one of the things a lot of people, um, comes up a lot in the science is how do you know it works? We believe the patient. If they're better, they're better. It's pretty simple. So I want to thank our team. This is the Roots to Thrive team. It's an immense group of people that are, show up heart opened. A lot of us uh, actually put our salaries right back into the program because we know it's necessary to keep things going. And I uh, just want to say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crisco. Our final panelist of this panel is Dr. Tony Back. Dr. Back was educated at Stanford University and Harvard Medical School and is professor of medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. His research has been funded by the National Cancer Institute and numerous foundations, and he founded Vital Talk as a nonprofit to disseminate his work in serious illness communication. He completed the California Institute of Integral Studies program and is PI on the first clinical trial of psilocybin-assisted therapy for doctors and nurses with symptoms of depression and burnout associated with their frontline work in the COVID pandemic. Welcome to the stage, Tony Back. Thank you. Uh, hey, ho hello, Horizons. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, research and how I actually got into this work and give you an anecdote from the research that I've been doing. Um, I come to you from um, the land of the Coast Salish, uh, also known as Seattle, where I live and work. And, you know, my ancestral background is uh, a Korean American. I was actually uh, born and grew up right on the other side of the Columbia River here in Vancouver, Washington. Um, but in my ancestral tradition, um, the Asian tradition, there are actually reports of um, mushrooms that go back thousands of years, and in those translations, they're called the laughing mushrooms. And I am striving to bring that um, sensibility to this. And over the years, I've worked with many physicians in, in a bunch of different ways, and, and that's how I got to the issue where I am now, which is this issue of what's happened post-pandemic. You may know that doctors and nurses right now are really grappling with the psychological costs of caring during the pandemic. Um, you know, in the beginning, there was this tremendous personal vulnerability. You know, there were people whose lovers left, who couldn't get roommates, who Uber drivers would not pick up on the street, right? I mean, there's that level of isolation and vulnerability. And, and then there was this experience of seeing all these people die suddenly in front of them, nobody else around in the room because they're the only ones who are allowed to be in there, and people who died very physically painful, difficult deaths. 
And then finally, in the you know, second wave of the pandemic, um, you know, then they're coming to work and people are accusing them of lying, they're spitting at them, they're throwing bedpans at them, and these are clinicians who are like, uh, I'm not sure I really signed up for this. And so that's the kind of situation that is leading what's happening now. You may not realize this, but there's this massive turnover of healthcare providers happening. And PAN's program is, I think, one of the things that is helping address that. You know, if you measure their symptoms, they are clearly higher than ever. And, and then that's what led me to this scientific question is, is could psilocybin really help this? The way I got to this was through my background as a medical oncologist, um, I started to look at the research and I thought, wow, is there really something to this? And so I actually had my own guided experience as a way of deciding, is this really worth spending time on? And I had a profound experience. And part of that experience, and I'll just flash, flash forward to the very end of this, is you know, the sense of could I, could I, as a healer, serve my patients more fully if I paid more attention to what lies beyond what I saw during that experience as my small self? So I'm here to say that I'm a researcher who is interested in doing some really good science because I think that is an important leverage point in creating the social change about psychedelics that we want to have. Um, and as a gay man, I can tell you, I grew up during the bad old days of AIDS and I watched a group of gay men who knew nothing about the medical system infiltrate scientific review committees, get onto policy committees, create advocacy, and develop media attention like the US had never seen before. And we are living in the aftermath of that movement now. The work that I do now in palliative care, <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> you know, a, a thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a thing that, um, uh, I have a little bit of survivor's guilt about the men my uh, generation who aren't here because uh, they uh, were uh, smarter than I was, uh, more motivated than I was, they were better looking than I was, and um, <laughs> now I'm like, oh my God, I'm the one who has to do this. But that's a whole different story. Um, I want to just say, as I got into this, and so as, as I got it, so I actually think, just to build on what Bennett said yesterday, I mean, there is a way that we, as a collective, um, because I really believe that there needs to be this community kind of thing and this academic thing happening at the same time. I think the co-development is really important and could be really fruitful to recreate a kind of healthcare system that actually really serves us. Um, and so that's the spirit in which I'm going into this. But I'm going to go into the science now because, you know what, when you want, are talking to policymakers, boy, they want to see the data. And so this is how we are producing this. This is the website for my trial. Uh, we did all the recruitment virtually. Um, here are the, some of the details. It's a randomized trial because that's the strongest science. I'm doing the first psychedelic trial ever done at the University of Washington, and I wanted something that the IRB and the Scientific Review Committee would not blink an eye about. In my trial, however, after the randomized phase is over, people who uh, got the placebo have the opportunity to have open-label psilocybin, and the primary outcome is collected only 28 days after the first medicine day. So there is, I think, and I think this is really important, the opportunity for everybody who participates to have a psilocybin experience. The design of the trial is otherwise quite conventional um, because I wanted to build on the science that is there. Two therapists, one patient, a couple of prep sessions, medication session, three integration sessions, it all happens over about, you know, a month and a half. And it, I'll tell you, it feels really quick. Uh, the psilocybin I'm using is from the USONA Institute. The data platform I'm using is Quantified Citizen, who did the amazing uh, microdose study with Paul Stamets and Pam Crisco that was recently published in Nature. The music I'm using is by WavePaths. Mendel Kalin uh, gave me a special uh, generative plus curated playlist. And we did experiential training for the therapists that I'm working with. Um, and I just wanted to give out a shout out to Alex Beltzer, who was on the NYU team and the Yale team, and Stacia Butterfield, who came to the Whidbey Institute and did a beautiful holotropic breath retreat for us. 
the training for the raters who are looking at the primary outcome, because actually we're having people interview the clinicians about their symptoms because clinicians are so likely to underestimate and underreport their symptoms on a self-reported questionnaire. So we actually have them be interviewed. And that training was done by Christian Yavorsky of Valus Bioscience. Um, I also wanted to just put a shout out to the funders because the funders have a huge and a very important role in doing this. So this trial is being funded by the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation. I got supplemental funding to create a diverse team therapist team from the Re Alex and Rita Hillman Foundation. I got um, a, a supplemental funding for an interdisciplinary team from the River Sticks Foundation, and I had an unrestricted educational grant from Cybin for the therapist training. I would also like to, sh to give a little shout out to some of my scientific ancestors, just because uh, some of them are here. So Paul Stamets, Pam Crisco, Alex Belzer, um, who was at Cybin, but also um, Steve Ross, who you heard from this morning, um, and Ben Kelmendy at Yale. Uh, they, plus Roland Griffiths, were incredibly generous and made it possible for me as a newbie into the field to do this. And I think it's this kind of cooperation that we need to notice and reward, because in many ways, what we are talking about here you know, in the midst of this discussion of extractive capitalism is really about um, what the Northwest Indians would call a gift economy, right? A gift is only a gift when it is given freely and when it is reciprocated. It's not just enough to receive the gift. The gift isn't meaningful unless you keep it in motion, right? So now I want to share one anecdote about uh, a, a subject from the trial. This is number 106, a uh, physician uh, in the emergency room, they had an extraordinarily difficult time in the pandemic and came to me, came to our study with nightmares about horrible deaths where they felt they maybe could have done more, even though there was no objective evidence about it, uh, a growing level of anxiety such that they woke up dreading that they would go into work in the morning. and this also sense of this background buzzing noise that is always there in our interviews. On the medication day, about 45 minutes into them, they, they gave a huge <laughs> laugh and said, I don't think I'm getting the placebo. <laughs> <laughs> we were very quiet because, you know, we're not supposed to tell them if we know, and of course we don't know, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, I'll come back to this blinding issue later. Uh, a week later, um, and, and I will say, he ha this person had a really big experience um, with visions of being part of this huge black machine that was churning away. And then other visions of, you know, fields of sunflowers that had all his wife, that all had his wife's face on them. And he came through this really feeling like a, a totally different person, right? Um, he said he felt free to let all his emotions shine through. He said the buzzing was gone. Um, he said he went back to work and saw the same, compl same patients and said, wow, this is a different way of being with them. I can actually listen to their complaining. I can be with my own worries about what's happening to them medically. I can reassure them. I can extend myself and be compassionate in a way that I have not been for some time. Um, you know, this person's big fear uh, was that he would never be happy again, mm -hmm. that he wasn't sure if he could go back and recover the kind of well-being he had had before the pandemic. And, and I think it's really a great example. He is an index example of the kind of effect that these things can have. And then at three weeks, um, he told us that his wife had renamed his anxiety from Eeyore, <laughs> right, to Piglet, right? <laughs> And for those of you who are interested in the qualitative outcomes, like that to me says it all there. This was an unsolicited evaluation that he just happened to report at the end of his interview. And to me, right, like this is more valuable than any like number. But for those of you who want the numbers, here it is, right? He started out at a 24, that's moderate symptoms, of, that's moderate severity of depression. And after, you know, this whole thing, he was a one. And months later, he is still a one. Now, 
Not everybody has, ha has had this dramatic of a response. He was, in retrospect, I think, unusually well prepared for this experience, and I think in ways that we are just beginning to understand. So I wanted to say something about some early lessons that I'm taking away from this research. And, and just parenthetically, this is how we present the medicine to them. The pill is on the left, there's a mushroom on the right. It's not a real psilocybin mushroom, right? That would be illegal, but uh, it's to remind all of us that this medicine actually comes from the earth, right? So I'll just say a few notes. We recruited for this study without a mental health clinician network at all. We attained inclusivity through very targeted outreach to specific groups and a diverse team of therapists so we could reassure clinicians of different backgrounds that there would be somebody kind of like them that would be on the other end listening. The blinding, I would say, is kind of problematic, right? Like, I, I don't I'm, I, maybe people in other research settings have different experiences, but it's like it's not really great blinding, and I think we as scientists are going to have to figure out what do we really want to do about this problem, because we need controls, but I'm not sure about blinding. And then I would say experiential training is really essential for the therapist team, because I am a... It, this whole experience has convinced me that unless therapists had their own experiences, they will not be personally available and able to deal with what happens when things get gnarly during the session. I had uh, the very first patient. <laughs> Thank you. The very first patient treated said to me that I could see that you were sitting there thinking about me and I could feel it. I could feel this glow from you coming into me. And in fact, I think of these, I'm, I'm a long-term Zen person, and my uh, teacher is actually Joan Halifax, and I was in fact doing a med, I, I think of these as uh, day-long meditation uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's what I was doing at the time. It was a little creepy. But, <laughs> but powerful in the sense that it says, how carefully we as therapists need to be prepared to hold space for all the stuff that's going to happen within. And we need to create these really robust containers for this work. Uh, last slide, future directions. This is actually a forest that's about an hour outside Amsterdam. And I've been doing some work with um, the Synthesis Institute as a group facilitator, because I think the future, in, in many ways, as, as what Chris is talking about, is in groups. And in this beautiful forest, th uh, they do these beautiful ceremonies. And, and I think there is a way that we can weave these things together. I think there is a way we can weave all the benefits of ceremony and all the meaning that that brings into these scientific settings where we need to collect real data and be really rigorous about what happens with people. So. You all make me so grateful to be here in the Pacific Northwest doing this work. Um, so little logistical snafu, the app for questions is down. So I'm just going to ask some questions and lead a conversation up here on the fly. Hope that's OK. Um, thank you all for your amazing heart-centered talks. Um, it really, really strikes me, this balance of the importance of science and data, but also the community and the needs that need to be met now, that we don't have time to do everything in a laboratory and to do the clinical trials, not that we should throw them out the window, but that we need to get creative and we need to find ways to do this work and meet the needs of people who are suffering now. So thank you all for your commitment to doing the work that way. I'd like to ask, I like this idea of kind of sharing more examples and qualitative information and just experience of what it's like doing this implementation, getting creative um, and making adjustments because it, it is complicated um, and I think it really helps to hear those stories. Um, so Chris, my first question is for you simply because this is something we've talked about a lot recently um, as you are implementing a psilocybin study at the VA hospital 
um, in the recovery treatment program, the substance abuse treatment program. So you are having to work with an existing structure, an existing system that is very old and has been operating a certain way for a very long time. And you're kind of coming in saying, okay, I'm gonna do this now. And I'm wondering if you could just share what some of the challenges and maybe some of the pleasant surprises have been um, and what it's been like to uh, make those adaptations. Sure. Yeah, I think um, first and foremost, just relationships and finding the people, the people within these systems that are really doing things differently. And so I think building a team of people who are in the residential treatment program who really understand what we're trying to do. Um, there, there are several people in the program who have gone through the MAPS training and want to support in whatever way they can. Um, and I think, I mean, first of all, the only reason I have had the courage to do this trial is because Peter Hendricks was, has for a long time been doing a study of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for crack cocaine users. And so, um, really wanting to look at the marginalized of the marginalized. Um, and so I think one of the benefits that I identified early on was doing it within this residential system. So people had, you know, multiple therapists that they were working with, including someone that they were seeing before and continue to see after they were in the residential program, uh, wraparound medical care, the social work support. And then when we started doing the study, there were so many instances where it was kind of the system coming up against doing things very differently. Um, and so it really, I mean, it has been a lot of um, individual conversations, a lot of times getting the entire treatment team together and just talking through what's going on and talking about splitting. And um, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know how to translate this yet into like a bigger thing, but I think so far it's individual conversations. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that struck me as all of you were speaking as well, just and, and doing this myself um, in the work that I do, is, is the time that it takes to build the relationships, to build the networks, to build the interdisciplinary teams, to learn each other's language. Um, because when we're operating in, in not a hierarchical model, um, you know, figuring out like what everybody needs to collaborate effectively and making sure that we're not um, misunderstanding one another because we have different languages that we used. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense that it's, it's really the relationships. Um, Tony, I'm wondering if you have anything to add on this topic since you mentioned this is the first study yeah. ever in the University of Washington of yeah. any sort of psychedelic and trying to get, I know I went to undergrad at UW, <laughs> so I know how much they love hard data in general, totally. or they did 20 years ago. Oh, they still do. Like, it's their <laughs> bread and butter, you know, it's their business model. Like, big science is their business model. Um, there is something about relationships. You know, I was a known quantity to the scientific review committees in the IRB, and when my study got funded, even before I had submitted an IRB application, the head of the IRB called me and said, what are you doing? And, uh, <laughs> so we had a little discussion, and actually she told me, okay, here's what you need to do. She read me a punch list of 10 things that I had to do in my IRB application, and boy, I did them. And it went through amazingly easily. Similarly, the um, chief medical officer at my health system said, uh, are these people going to come back to work? And I said, uh, because he was like, I don't think they should be coming back to work if they've been doing this. Like, how do we know that they're not going to be, like, altered? And I said, okay, this confidentiality is going to be a big thing. And so then we put on the website, you should not use your work email to contact us. You should uh, write... And, and, we are making a point about symptoms of depression and burnout because we take care not to diagnose anybody with depression. You know, if you're a doctor or clinician in the state of Washington, you have to report that when you apply for relicensing. So we're not making diagnoses. Uh, we're just measuring symptoms. And, and we participating in a study, we're very clear with that everybody does not constitute mental health care, so they don't have to report that either. Right, then we went through a little additional paperwork to get an FDA certificate of confidentiality. So like even if we are subpoenaed, God knows mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, that we will not have to disclose identities because mm -hmm. the people who I am treat, uh, you know, enrolling, these are not psychonauts. They, had to, they haven't even all read Michael Pollan's book. <laughs> they're just, I mean, they're just trying everything. 
because they're miserable. And so we are really trying to respect that. But what it means is you have to know how to work the levers of the institutions that do these things because there are good reasons for them, right? There's a good reason for the FDA to be worried about how people are protected, right? I'm mm -hmm. thinking back to the, all the birth defects that came out of thalidomide. That's where this whole FDA thing came from. And so it's, it is regulation, but th there are, there is a logic to it that we have to actually learn how to work and we can learn how to do it. Amazing. Yeah, lots of paperwork in institutions. You've got to just buckle down and do the paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, Pam, one question for you. Um, I am not fully aware of kind of how Health Canada operates, but as you were sharing about all of these participants that Health Canada has given exemptions to to allow psilocybin treatment, I couldn't help but think, like, how do we do that here? Um, and I don't know, you know, what's going on on the policy end of things here. I know we have right to try, and there's a lot of debate around that and suing the DEA, and I'm not really sure where that is. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any insight or thoughts about how that works in Health Canada and how that might be similar or different here and what we can do to open up access for folks. Well, our work with Health Canada has been many, many years. We've been meeting with them open-heartedly, transparently for many years saying, this is what we hope to do and this is what we're going to do. And so we best do it together. And we, um, we're very collaborative. And um, to be very clear, we're very data-driven as well. We, everything we do goes through our ethics board, through harmonized ethics. Um, they know we're science-driven. And we just keep bringing them up the learning curve. And what is really encouraging with Health Canada is that um, as they get more comfortable with us and they see us publishing and they see us doing good science and they see that we're not trying to do anything sideways, we're completely transparent. We come to the table every time and we just go, this is what we're doing. There's nothing hidden, there's no games. And uh, you know, they see us as um, serious scientists, serious researchers, serious clinicians, uh, trying, to, trying to do why we went into medicine, which is be in service to our patients. And you know, I think I th they've come up the learning curve. I think uh, people in the bureaucracies uh, are there because they want to do good. I think they, it, you know, they, it's, it's, a different, um, it's a different space than when you're a clinician. When you're a clinician, you're always putting your neck on the line. You're always making that decision. You are responsible and you, you can be on the leading edge. Um, but sometimes when you're in the bureaucracies, being on the leading edge is not serving your position. So we've, so to answer your question, we've been working with Health Canada to show how this is uh, feasible, it's safe, and it's, it's effective. And, and they're delightful to work with. They're really wonderful people. And they, they're actually sitting down with us now and helping us uh, put together the clinical trials that they'll say yes to. So I think that's the thing is keep in mind that it's all about relationships, it's all about collaboration, it's all about why are we doing this. And for the policy people and the regulators out there, why are we doing this is we want to make a difference in this world. We want to, we want to be in science and medicine for the reason we signed up is to, to do good in this world. So we're better together, better collaborative. And so that's what I would suggest with the regulators and the FDA is see them as people, who yeah. they are, and reach out from the heart. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. relationships even with the regulators. Thank you for that. Um, this next question is for anybody who wants to answer. Um, I'm not even sure who said this. I wrote in my notes, um, therapy first, then study later. We need to meet the needs of clients now. And that really resonated with me because I feel like there is always this balance in working with you know, very acute clients um, that you just got to do what you got to do in the moment and you aren't always able to kind of follow you know, a really strict protocol. So this brings up this tension in me between risk taking and liability and backing up what I do as a clinician. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to share on the panel, wants to share kind of how that experience has been of, of balancing those things. Because we have to take risks to do this work. Like there's no way around it. Um, and we have liability. So how do we, how do we manage that? Well, I'll take a jump at that. So I, think that we can use the urgency of the chaotic health system and the dire solution that we are in um, regard, with regards to mental health as levers 
for action and bureaucratic movement and fun. Take all those things together to create the mass of stuff that we will need to get the FDA to move uh, and because I, they work a little differently than Health Canada. That said, I have talked to a number of people now in the FDA who actually have a sympathetic ear to this, and they want to see uh, work that is done to their standard. And, and so I do think we have to be, as a community, a little careful about not trying to go too fast. I mean, we need to move quickly, and we need to have the resources to do it. The reason I say that is because I think if we have too many well-publicized disaster cases, and I'm thinking specifically of that cover story thing, right, that cover story podcast, those things actually could set us back. And we, are, as a field, are going to have to come up with very carefully crafted public messaging about how to do that as we move from the face of, this is the miracle cure for everything, to these are, me these are medicines and experiences that have you know, very well-defined uses and a, a body of expertise around them. And I, I think that's the transition that we are now making as a field. And so I think we have to be super careful about that. So really, uh, like we have to work together and you, w the Lone Rangers who go out and do stuff that is super risky, you're putting us all at risk. And so I would just ask that we have this discussion about what kind of risk that we can collectively take as a group of scientists and activists. Because um, I think it'll, we need us, I, what I learned from the HIV era is that it takes all of us, right? Can I add to that? I would, I would say that the, the safety and collaborative teams is essential. I feel that when, because we have so many um, stakeholders at the table, uh, the whole medical team, indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, people from all the patients. I think that's the safety, is people come together and there's lots of ideas and there's lots of people leaning in and policy makers leaning in and that's, that's, we're going to be more thoughtful the yeah. more we're together. So it, it speaks to like not being lone rangers, be on teams, be collaborative, share resources, come together. And I think we can do this very mindfully. I yeah. think we're adults, I think we can do this. Absolutely. And we as leaders, we as leaders are going to have to have the skills to hold those spaces, manage those collaborations, because you know what? They get pretty gnarly. And any of you who have worked on that kind of team, uh, you know what? I'll know you by your battle scars, honestly. Uh, and that's part of the work that we're in right now. Yeah, that really, that got me right there. Um, yeah, does anyone have in the last six minutes or so um, anything they'd like to share with the audience about some of the most inspiring moments in doing this particular work? I would li I'd like to add, um, I just feel so privileged and honored to be able to do this work. And um, one of our participants in, um, in one of our early cohorts it was a First Nations uh, leader. And after, after her session um, in a ceremony that uh, we, were, we were part of, she said, you know, when I came into the program, I said, how the hell am I going to heal with all these white people? And she goes, now, now that I've been through it, I realize that's the only way we are going to heal. Yeah. And that was really profound. And what was even more profound is because we work out at this new name is First Nations territory, when we did our first psilocybin yeah. group session there, the elders next door in the longhouse drummed for us. Mm. So we are better together. So <laughs> it's a privilege. <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you. And time is actually up. This clock is different than the real time. So thank you all so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.